sitting in the morning sun. I'll be sitting in the evening con. Okay, back for another video here. Uh, this time it is sustaining aquatic biodiversity uh, that we'll be talking about. So, let's get started here. Uh, chapter 11 in your textbook, Sustaining Aquatic Biodiversity. Alright, so uh, the chapter starts off with a case study in Lake Victoria. Really, you could do case studies in any state uh, of the United States. You could probably pick any country and there's going to be water issues and mostly related to things that people have done um, and uh, unintentional consequences to start off with um, but here's an example of it and this is in Africa in uh, Lake Victoria uh, so what they did is they had a couple of things going on at the same time that really degraded the quality of the lake and uh, one of them was the Nile perch they thought they would be good for fishing and they were big fish and uh, they did uh, work out very nicely for a short time but they became uh, an invasive species introduced species that uh, was able to outcompete the local species so there was a big loss of biodiversity and in particular the chicklids were lost and here is what a chicklid looks like but these fish were central to the ecosystem and pretty important to it and a uh, big part of the food chain and also they would clean off algae blooms and uh, when the chicklets were gone that was a big hit to the uh, lake as well so yeah they were uh, adding nutrient runoff as we've discussed with eutrophication so that would be nitrates and phosphates and also throwing in sewage and with less of the chicklets there uh, the lake got degraded so this is located in Africa uh, but like I said you could pick any place in the world and uh, you're going to find some water issues from human uh, activities. Okay, so this is the Happy Days, and that's a pretty big fish, and they enjoyed fishing for it, and like I said, it then uh, degraded the whole lake. All right, so um, there are a lot of things that we don't know here about the aquatic biodiversity, like all life on Earth. There's still lots for us to learn. What we do know is that the greatest areas of biodiversity are the coral reefs, and we know they're in jeopardy as well, but... Um, uh, there was a lot of biodiversity there and also in the estuaries where the rivers meet the uh, ocean where the uh, fresh water meets the salt water there's a lot of biodiversity there and uh, on the deep ocean floor and you maybe ask yourself why on the floor of the ocean could there be a lot of life and the reason is uh, gravity that uh, nutrients are brought down to the ocean floor by gravity and as they float down there they call that marine snow and that provides a lot of nutrients, so there can be a biodiversity uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Out in the open sea, not as much, um, but uh, you can imagine near the coast is where you find uh, a lot of the biodiversity. And we see that. We live uh, pretty close to the coast ourselves. All right, so um, we've talked in previous chapters about the damage that humans are doing to the environment uh, that we found out about, and there's the handy acronym for it. So hopefully you're very familiar with HIPCO by now, and HIPCO applies to the marine um, and um, freshwater environments as well, of course. So the first thing is habitat loss and, and uh, degradation. People do like to live by the shore. We've done a lot of development in the coastal area that results in habitat loss. Also got rid of uh, uh, wetlands and uh, that lo leads to big habitat loss as well. <clears throat> Um, on the ocean floor, also damaging it by pulling trawlers across. And we'll talk a little bit later about what trawlers are and the different fishing methods. In freshwater, we uh, put up dams, so that causes problems, reroutes uh, the water, uh, creates a big lake behind it that destroys habitats with flooding and um, also can lead to less water downstream, less nutrients getting downstream. Uh, but certainly habitat loss would be affected by that as well. And later on, we'll talk about all kinds of water diversion projects that we've tried and, um, and done more damage in some cases than, than good. But again, we're learning as we go, so uh, that's okay. Here are the trawlers and the uh, idea that, you know, on the left-hand side you have a healthy ocean bottom and on the right side it's after the trawlers come through and they really just drag like a giant rake and just drag everything across there and rip it up and very effective for picking up what you're trying to pick up but uh, these unintended consequences you don't leave much behind 
Okay, so invasive species we know are the eye and hipco, so they are also a part of this as well. And uh, we've got the idea that there's a large area uh, that has been taken over by invasive species when it comes to the uh, coastal areas. And uh, we know about our studies of invasive species before that they take over ecosystems and they uh, they break the whole thing down and in some cases drive off other species completely. And um, well, here's an estimate. I don't, I don't know how they uh, come up with these estimates. And uh, the making of this video 2019, I'm not sure what the estimate would be, but uh, the idea is that they cause a lot of damage. And that's a, mo a monetary thing as well. It's not just the ecosystems, it's how it affects us because we're relying on all of those things as well. We've done um, some things in class about uh, invasive species. And um, so we've actually heard about all three of these in class by now, I believe. At least in 2019, we, uh, we did. And um, here are three examples that we could be talking about. The hyacinth, and uh, that's another problem in Lake Victoria. And um, eels and the purple uh, loose stripe as well, uh, which is on the coastal areas as well. Fre freshwater areas, I've seen them. Um, okay, so this is what the, this looks like it's a nice field. But uh, if you look, there's a boat there, and this is actually out in the water. So this is the hyacinths taking over, and uh, that's, uh, that was an unintended consequence of that invasive species. Um, okay, so uh, here's one, too, where, you know, we always talk about the problems, and we like to talk about the solutions as well. So humans create these problems, sometimes unintendedly, and it's amazing feats of technology that get us uh, to the point that we can cause that much damage. And once we realize it, we're pretty clever in cleaning things up as well. So there's a lot of success stories there. Of course, it's a lot easier to prevent damage than to clean it up afterwards. Uh, but sometimes you don't have a choice, and hopefully in the future, uh, decisions will be made understanding the unintended consequences of the past and uh, cut down on the cleanup. But for now, we got a lot of cleanup if uh, we're looking to uh, improve areas. So here's an example of a uh, person who uh, had invasive species that took over a lake in Wisconsin, a eutrophic lake in Wisconsin. And uh, the picture you're going to see here just shows that once you re remove the carp, the theory was the carp were causing the problem, uh, that you would have a recovery. And that's what they did here. But just imagine uh, if you've got your whole lake there just to rope off a piece of it. What are you going to, you know, it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of money rather than trying to prevent the invasive species from getting in there in the first place. But it's tricky to do that in water and on land. There's so many uh, ways to transport, and uh, we're so connected in our transportation that, uh, that these things uh, do happen and are, and are hard to prevent. And once an invasive species gets into uh, a place where it's having a lot of success, it's really hard to stop them. All right, in HIPCO, the next two P's are the population growth and pollution, definitely related to each other, more people creating more pollution. And uh, we've talked a few times about the idea of the cultural eutrophication, and there's the idea of the nitrates and the phosphates. So those are a danger to water, and uh, we've talked about that. Lots of connections you can make with uh, eutrophication. Um, so... And uh, yeah, so the nitrates and the phosphates enter the water, and then they uh, are nutrients, excess nutrients, and that's when the uh, algae grows. And that's a little bit of a problem because the algae blocks off the light for the photosynthesis, so there's less oxygen in the water, and that's uh, bad for the things that are living there. And also, um, the bacteria then goes after uh, the algae, and they create a big need for oxygen as well. And that's where most of the oxygen goes to the BOD, the biological oxygen demand of the uh, bacteria. And uh, there you go. That leads to problems as well. All right, so also sewage and industrial runoffs. And, you know, if you're living by the shore, that has been looked at as a convenient place to dump things, rivers as well. And now we're finding out about the consequences. So here are estimates as well. Only 4% of the ocean unaffected. And, yeah, so most of it's coming from, from the land. And, of course, we do have a whole shipping industry out there as well and uh, the things that come in from the air as well. All right, so here's the idea of plastics getting into the waters, and, of course, that affects the wildlife as well. And We're finding out that these plastics, uh, which were, again, amazing feat of technology and a discovery there, um, have some pretty big unintended consequences when you can't get rid of them and they keep piling up. Um, so this is the Pacific Garbage Patch. 
um, which is a huge collection now of plastic out in the water. And uh, because of the currents in the ocean, they start to collect in a big area. So you get these huge amounts of plastic just out there. And uh, that's not so great for any of the things that are trying to live out there in the water, of course. And um, yeah, that's, that's, you can't argue that humans did that one, that's for sure. But again, like I said, and I often say in class, the hope is the, uh, you young people, you know, you are the future and every generation uh, has the chance to move things forward and to uh, make things better than we do. We keep increasing our knowledge base and uh, what we're able to do. And here's a good example of the uh, Ocean Cleanup Project. And uh, the Ocean Cleanup here, I'm going to show you the uh, web page which is oceancleanup.com. And the idea here is um, we're looking for solutions, of course, right? As, uh, as humans do as well. So we're looking for the solutions, and uh, this is a company that's formed uh, that is really working toward that. And there's a lot of solutions that people are looking for for this problem. We've recognized it as a big problem, and there's a pretty big awareness of it. So this is a good web page to go to. I'll put the link on the uh, when we get back to the presentation. Uh, as well, but uh, here we go. This is a current thing: five trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean, and uh, yeah, the Pacific Garbage Patch is the is the largest one between Hawaii and California. And again, they come together because of all these currents. So here's a solution that they're coming up with to use those currents also uh, to collect them. And their estimate is that they're going to be able to cut cut it down 50 percent uh, every. Uh, Every year, I guess is the idea. Every five years, I'm sorry. Our models indicate that a full-scale rollout could clean up 50% in five years. All right, so that seems to be a good idea. Anyway, worth a try, and um, I find the whole thing uh, fascinating. Another thing that I think is fascinating about this uh, particular uh, program here is it started, there's the web page as I told you, so go check around there. Gain some more information. Take a, take a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there. Uh, but the uh, person's name is Boylan Slat. And um, he started, I guess, as a teenager. And I uh, saw a TED Talk. Maybe we'll see that at some point or another. So he's a very young person, you know, about your ages. Um, as a high school project, he was coming up with ways to clean up plastic out of the water. And he's very interested in the uh, ocean. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, Dutch, I think that's where his uh, background is. Uh, but now he has uh, started an ocean cleanup company. Uh, he's, uh, he's a little bit older now. Um, so uh, I guess he's about 24, 25 years old here in uh, 2018. And, um, and there you go. All right. Okay, 2018, 2019, what did I say earlier? 2019? It's the 2018, 2019 school year. All right, for the record. Okay, and then HIPCO, we come to the uh, seas, the climate change, and uh, there's a big problem as well. We have the sea levels rising, and uh, that becomes a problem for the um, biodiversity as well. So coral reefs, you're getting some areas, islands that are going to go underwater, and habitat is lost. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are living right at the coast in an intertidal zone. And they all have their niches, and they kind of got the whole thing marked out there. So when those shifts happen, that's uh, that's not a good thing. So yes, um, right. So already we're seeing this kind of thing in areas that are right at sea level, or places like New Orleans that are below sea level actually. So they're lo losing the wetlands. And um, one of the things, is the storms that they have down in, in New Orleans, uh, the wetlands slow the storms down, and they slow the wind speeds down. Um, so when you're when you're done with your your uh, wetlands, uh, you, you've lost some of that as well. Um, okay, so the coral reefs and and then the climate change is also a problem for the coral reefs because the temperature goes up, and as the temperature goes up, you know the coral reefs are a, a coral skeleton, and then they have the algae on the top of them, and as the temperatures go up, the algae can't uh, hang on anymore, and that's coral uh, bleaching that goes on there. So that's a problem there with the uh, with the warming up of the temperatures. So the sea levels rise, you know, as land-based ice melts, goes into the water, doesn't come back again, and, um, and yeah, so that's why that's a threat to our water area, some of the reasons it is. All right, and then this is uh, one about uh, protecting the uh, mangrove swamps. So um, 
you know, again, they're in danger from these climate changes as well. And uh, another thing, they are in uh, Indonesia there, they're being used uh, for shrimp farming. So they degrade the mangroves as well. And then they, um, the mangrove forests, which also work as a buffer towards storms in the shore. They're along the, the waterways, uh, the mangroves are. And um, yeah, so without them there, the impact is a little bit more. And like I say, they're being degraded also um, for shrimp farming. And that's a big one. All right, so that's the idea of the mangroves. And you read about that in your book as well. So HIPCO, uh, you know, over... Uh, exploiting the thing is the O in HIPCO, so we're getting down to it. And uh, the idea is that, well, you know, you think about it, <clears throat> the fish um, that we're going after now as food, it's the last wild caught food for the most part, right? I mean, people do some hunting here or there, but the majority of people don't get their food from hunting as we once did. Uh, we're not hunting wild food anymore like we did for the majority of human existence. Uh, but now we're, we're, we have that refined a bit, of course. And, um, but we still go after the fish in, in the ocean. Uh, but less and less because we're starting to farm them as well. And we're so good at it that uh, we're taking uh, maybe too much out that's not sustainable. And that's the thing that's going on with fishing right now. So we may be the last generation that has largely wild-caught fish. We'll see. Um, okay, so again, the, there's lots of things that we've done. Um, and this is getting getting rid of the fish in a big way. One of these things was um, the cod fishing, and uh, I believe that was up in um, in uh, the Massachusetts area. I think we'll see maybe a little. Um, well, I think we see on the next slide. Uh, but they got rid of the sharks. We know sharks are a keystone species, and then there was a whole ripple effect of this thing, and, and also because of. Uh, how good they got, we've got because of technological advances that humans get, are able to come up with, got so good at fishing that we took out an unsustainable amount. And the whole industry collapsed, which was a big, big financial blow to that area. All right, so bycatch is where you catch uh, fish that you didn't intend to. So you, you go after catching fish in a big way, and one-third of it is what you intended to get, and the other two-thirds you didn't, but that's uh, hard news for the animals that you caught. And our fish print, like our ecological footprint, is two and a half times. So we're consuming fish at uh, two and a half times the amount of fish that will have to be sustainable. Uh, yeah, off the Canadian coast. Here we go. I knew it was up north there. Uh, but I think mean, this has happened in other places as well. But we'll go with off the Canadian coast, and you can see that in the 70s. So it got really good <laughs> during the upper end of the graph here at taking them out, but uh, crashed the whole thing. All right. There we go. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Okay, so like a lot of things, uh, you're expected to know, you know, the different types of fishing that are being done. So here's the four of them, and we'll put them into a graphic for you. And, uh, well, you know, it wasn't too long ago that you had to really kind of know where the fish were, and you had to have an instinct for it, and... You know, people who are fishing, first of all, still are. I mean, it's not like an easy thing to do necessarily. It's hard work, of course. Um, but the technology has made it a very different game than it was before. So uh, spotter airplanes, that's a relatively recent thing too. People have been fishing, the, uh, fishing for food for a very long time. But uh, spotter airplanes are pretty new. So that's a technology as well. Um, fish farming, as I said, aquaculture is becoming a big thing. We'll talk about that later on in uh, later chapters. And uh, the sonar. So, you know, we can send a sound signal down. When it bounces off the fish and comes back, we got an idea of the depth that they're at and also that they're down there. Especially if you know what the water usually is, what the depth usually is, and you have a good sense of what's going on there. You get a signal that shows you it's a little bit lower and there's a big thing going on, and you probably stop the boat and and see what you can do. All right, so that's the idea there. And the trawler, again, once you see them down there, the trawler is just raking it across the, uh, the bottom and uh, rips a bunch of stuff up as it goes. The bycatch, of course. Okay, so this is the purse scene fishing, and it's just like a big giant per uh, purse. So you put, put it out there, and the fish are just uh, swimming through or hanging around, and you scoop them up. 
So that's a big one there. And of course, again, uh, you know, you have to have some heavy machinery to be able to make that lift. And we can put it on a boat now, which we're familiar with. Uh, but again, that has drastically changed the game of fishing. The technology goes around, along with all of this. So then the question is, what do you do about it? All right, so here's the long line fishing. So you throw out a lot of lines with hooks and you catch a lot of what you're looking for. And uh, according to the, um, the book, two thirds of it is unintended catch with all of these systems. So here's again, you have the fish farming maybe up there, deep sea aquaculture. So we're doing a lot more of that. Uh, like I said, we'll talk about that in later chapters. And this is the drift net. So again, you just have a big net that you put out there and everything swims in and you know, there's really, you can see it, but there's, uh, I don't have any here and it's not a pleasant sight, but you see dolphins and turtles and, and things caught up in there. And, uh, that's, that's not good. All right, so what are we going to do about all this stuff? It's going to be hard to do this. It's the big ocean, you know, so we're getting more advanced with our technology. Um, I guess at some point or another, we'll be able to monitor through satellites. Probably can right now, but you'd have to have people checking it out and seeing for uh, things that are going wrong. And you know, It's a daunting task right now, but the technology makes it easier for us to know what's out there. Um, but it's still a big, big, wide open ocean out there. So hard to figure out what's going on. Another thing uh, about it is uh, it's um, a little bit of a question about, you know, whose uh, water is it anyway? You know, you have rights from the coastline and then after that it's open seas so uh, there's no jurisdiction, you know, so you have to have international agreements and then you have to hope that people keep them. Um, okay, so uh, we don't see all of this stuff all at once, uh, but it catches up with us and uh, again, you know, it is a big ocean but it isn't uh, inexhaustible, but we've kind of treated it like that up till now in many ways. Okay. All right. So um, there's the other story about the whales. I mean, this is, if you've ever seen pictures of whale hunts, it's just, it's brutal, of course. And um, it seems like a big shame uh, to have the whale hunts. And you have to ask yourself, what kind of people would do that, would hunt whales and uh, kill them like that for, uh, for whatever reason? And uh, I say this to be a little bit humorous, or, or to make a point, I guess, I don't, I don't know how funny any of it is, but the United States was a whaling nation not too long ago. So uh, definitely up in those areas of Massachusetts that I was talking about, and all along the coast, uh, we were killing whales, and uh, that was a, a for, source of uh, food uh, a little bit, but mostly it was for oil. And uh, that was used to power lamps and all that stuff. So uh, it really, really was a big industry. The whaling industry was um, in the United States not too long ago. All right, so uh, let's see here. These are uh, porpoises and whales we're talking about. And um, yeah, so we have become aware of this. And uh, there's a lot less of that going on now. So they've made a bit of a comeback. And uh, that's a good thing. So the U.S. has, uh, since 1970, um, put a ban on uh, things that are involved in whaling and whaling products and um, there we go. So uh, it does change industries a little bit. Some countries still rely on it and um, but you also protect the species and there you go. So majestic mammals that are out there of course and you get an idea of how large they are. I think we've all seen that. I've uh, been lucky enough to see them go by uh, while I was at the Jersey Shore. I've seen humpback whales go by which is pretty cool. All right, so you get the idea of the size of these things. There's the humpback, not one of the biggest whales, but uh, did wave at us when we were on the beach. That was a lot of fun. And um, here you got an idea of a picture. And yeah, it's, it's well, any, any time you're killing something, it's not maybe the most pleasant thing, that's for sure. Um, okay, so um, there are countries that don't want to get involved with these uh, sanctions, and they are still using these things as... Um, as an economic incentive as well, and they do eat the meat there as well in these places. And um, another thing is that they argue that it's a tradition, and, and part of what I said before. I mean, you know, you in the United States did it not too long ago. Who are you to tell us that we can't uh, do what we've been doing for so long? So, interesting. And those are the countries that are against it, and as I said, maybe because it's something that they've culturally done, or there's an economic incentive. So they could uh, be against that. Um, but these economic incentives can be used the other way around, too. And uh, whale watching is a big industry now, and people seem more interested in doing that than they do in uh, having the whales killed. 
And that's a good thing as well. Uh, one of the, these things that you can do is to areas that need the money for things that they're doing that are maybe not so great uh, environmentally, you can uh, you know, give them a, a chance to uh, get some money for that. And that's the reconciliation uh, uh, ecology. All right, so the turtles are another one too, and, and uh, people, the turtles now, right recently, the turtles are becoming a big thing in the school year 2018 to 2019 because a viral picture went out with a straw that got cut and cut off the breathing and killed a, a big turtle. And people feel emotionally attached to these turtles. Uh, you know, they like them, they're pretty cool, you know, they're not like anything that we see all the time, and they're uh, interesting to us as, uh, as humans. And, uh, you know, they live a couple hundred years, uh, these big ones do, and, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing there. And uh, they've been around for so long. But we're doing things, again, from the trawlers and the pollution and the climate change that are affecting them. And uh, But it's been a big move now to protect them. So when the uh, eggs are hatched, they'll rope off a beach, even if it's a beach that people enjoy swimming on and it's a popular location, they'll rope it off. And um, so we're getting a little bit more aware of that. And here you get a little bit of an idea, too, of these people helping out the turtle. Uh, but you can see caught up in the lines. That turtle wasn't their intended uh, catch there. That's the by bycatch. All right. So, and here's another person as well who is going about ways to uh, help uh, coral reefs come back. As I mentioned, we have the uh, problem with the coral reef bleaching. The other problem is carbon dioxide that gets in from the atmosphere. And uh, the carbon dioxide uh, mixes in and uh, interferes with the skeletal building of the uh, calcium carbonate. It becomes carbonic acid in the water, and it interferes interferes with the calcium carbonate. Um, you know, the, it's diverting uh, the necessary elements to form the skeleton. So the coral reefs are hitting a double treatment there, a double uh, double problem with the coral bleaching and with the skeletons from the from the trouble with the, the CO2. Okay, so here's a person again uh, trying to help out. We've mentioned a few of those. People are very inventive as well in that area. And they, uh, he's building an artificial reef and he is serving food at his restaurant that is only sustainable and you can help out the reef by being there. And, uh, that's a good thing. Mentioned before that uh, countries have rights off the shore. So, uh, you know, 200 miles goes, 370 kilometers. That's the uh, international agreement. And after that, it is the open seas. So, there, you know, uh, you got to think about that too. There are countries that are landlocked and they have no coastline at all. So, they don't have anything that they own right off of their country. So, the open seas are their alternative on that one. And so, a lot of stuff goes on out there. But, uh, yeah, it's not the same for people who have a coast and people who don't have a coast. Okay, so uh, that's true. And then outside of that, it's the high seas. So we have to get to international agreements. So, um, yeah, this is what I'm saying here with the inequity. 36% of the ocean and they have 90% of the fish stocks. So that's, uh, that's good to have a coastline there. All right, uh, the marine protected areas, that's the idea of what we do on land as well. And, uh, you know, if it's out on the high seas, of course, you have to have a larger area. You have migrations that are going on, and you need a lot more room. Uh, by the coast, in a smaller area, you'll protect a lot more species with the higher biodiversity. Um, but the idea is if you protect it, good things can happen, and the comeback is pretty quick. It's not a long turnaround for a lot of these fish. For the mammals, uh, it might be a little different. Uh, but for the fish... Uh, there's a big comeback, and that helps the mammals as well. All right, so California, in, as in many different environmental er areas and aspects, is a leader in this. Okay, so uh, if you're setting up these marine reserves, the idea is similar to what we do on land. Uh, you close it down to the fishing, so there's none of that going on. Maybe, again, in the middle, you have an area where no human activity is involved. Maybe outside of that core, you have something like an area for boats to go. Um, or something like that, but uh, this is a way of protecting it. And uh, like I said, it seems very successful in areas that it's been used as a quick, uh, quick comeback. Well, yeah, here's a graphic for it now. Population doubles, reproduction triples, there you go. So it's good, They're really good. Again, uh, you know, a lot of it in the environmental is the stuff that we've done that's damaging, and at the same time, and your generation is the next to do it, we have a chance to push everything forward. Okay, so um, here's the idea too, and again, 
um, you know, get the whole community together is a good idea. So um, even if you're in other parts of the world and you want to protect the coastline, you know, coming in and saying this is the law or something like that, that's maybe effective to a point. But, uh, you know, getting the local people involved is a big way to have it happen, take ownership in it. And there's been a lot of success in that already. There's a bigger, much bigger awareness of these things than there was, uh, you know, when I was in high school. All right, which was a couple few years ago. All right, so well, we've only closed off 1% of the uh, ocean right now. And, okay. And, uh, yes, this is talking about the CO2 that's a danger to the water. And, uh, as I mentioned, with the ocean uh, becoming acidified as well. And I also already mentioned how that, uh, one of the problems with that is that it uh, is bad for the coral reefs. It interferes with the skeleton development, the coral reef skeleton, the calcium carbonate. Um, okay, so this is the idea here too. And low-lying areas like this will be flooded, so those habitats are gone. And uh, some of the ones that we're looking at right now that are in jeopardy with the sea level rising, which is happening, is um, you know inhabited by humans as well. So there's a, there's a lot going on there. But here we're talking about the uh, the natural stuff, the, not the people stuff. Okay, so um, again, like I said, maybe there's a, uh, we have more and more technology going on. We're more and more aware of what's happening. So we can um, monitor this stuff a little bit differently than we did before. And maximum sustainable yield, that's what we've been doing. The idea is let's take out as much as we can and then, um, you know, and still have some or hope to have some left over. And optimum sustainable is where you take out the amount that is not just going to help you for the amount that you have, but is going to help maintain the ecosystem as well. So what's the best sustainable uh, yield that you got there? And this one is more not thinking about the one species that you're fishing or overfishing or looking to control the fishing of. It's looking about the, the ripple effect between the species, the multi-species management uh, there. All right, so again, like I said, these are things that are now put into computer models, and there's a lot of mathematics behind it, and information collecting, and, you know, there's a lot we don't know, but there's so much more that we knew before. And the precautionary principle, as always, is if you don't really know what you're doing, uh, don't push it too far, I guess. All right, so this is the idea again, and like I said, the communities have maybe uh, gotten together and said that that's going to be okay. So the local group working with the government, and... Uh, that seems to be the best approach, get people on board. Okay, so um, like with a lot of uh, industries, there's subsidies for them. So this is something that they said would be a, uh, maybe a good thing in the U.S. to cut down on things is to subsidize it. And if you don't know, the subsidies mean that, you know, government gives businesses money. Um, no, and in turn, the businesses employ people, so that's good. There's jobs created and all that. Uh, but, of course, the subsidies come from tax dollars, which come from uh, us anyway. So these are really, really interesting things that go on here. But uh, there you go. Um, so cut down on the illegal fishing. Well, again, that's, that's a good trick if you can do it and um, you know, get a little bit uh, stricter with the penalties for that um, because it is hard to police the whole thing. Okay, this individual transfer rights, uh, we're going to be talking about this later on with carbon emissions. It's called the cap and trade over there. But the idea there is that you get the right to fish a certain amount of stuff. You get to take a certain amount of fish out. And you can buy these rights um, and uh, you own them. And if you don't use all of them, you can sell them to somebody else. And the idea here is that we're going to put a, and put it in charge of the people in the hands of the people who have these transfer rights. We're only going to take this amount out. So they're going to put a limit, and then they're going to give you rights to a certain amount of that. So this is... Uh, um, you know, been tried a few places, and like I said, it's got some similarities later on to what we'll talk about with the cap and trade in the carbon emissions. Uh, but yeah, a little bit difficult to enforce. Like I said, you're out on the ocean, so that's that's a little bit hard to figure out everything that's going on out there. And another thing that's happening in this is that the little folks are kind of being squeezed out by larger companies. So it really, you know, again, a lot of transformations have gone on, but for the fishing economically for human beings, you know, it was a like a hunter-gatherer kind of thing for a long time. Let's just feed our people that are around here. And then it was small groups that were along the coast that would be making the money and now with the machinery and all of this similar to agriculture it's becoming industrialized to a certain extent and that squeezes the little person out as well or has in some of these cases 
Um, okay, so this is uh, something you can do here. Uh, there's a lot more awareness, as I said, than there was when I was a younger person. And the uh, one of the things that we want to do is we want to feel good about the food that we're eating or the wood that we're using or uh, all of these things. So there is a stewardish, uh, stewardship council here, and they certify it. So if you trust in what they're doing, then when you buy something that they've certified, you feel good that it's being done sustainably. So there we go. And as we said before, you know, this, this is a little bit of a trick to do this. So um, we get everybody involved that we can. And, uh, and it does seem to be working in a lot of ways. Yeah, as usual, when you get to these slides, I think it's good to pause and take a look at all these things because this is these are free response questions in the making here, uh, just looking at all these things. And also the information that you should know about the fishing. So a lot of what we've talked about, but this gives you a one-stop uh, shopping on it. Uh, so as I'm talking, please, at any time, feel free to pause. I won't even know it and uh, look at all of them. I do want to talk about uh, the invasive species or non-native species on the lower right-hand corner and ship ballast, just to give you an idea what ship ballast is. And, uh, you know, a ship has water inside of it to keep it in sync with the water that it's floating in, and that's the ballast water. So without it, the ship isn't going to do too well at sea. But uh, if you, you know, in the past, we haven't realized, but if you take the ship ballast water that you've put in from one place and you bring it to another port, well, that's a great way for the invasive species to get in there. The Great Lakes are a major waterway, and that's how they've been invaded by the zebra mussel. <clears throat> which uh, is an invasive species that uh, your book talks about. It was also a, a free response question in uh, 2010, I believe. But, um, man, so um, these are things that we can do here in the lower right-hand corner about that ballast water. Um, you know, another thing that they do is try to put double holes on it, so, the, you know, it's hard for the ballast water to leak out. Maybe you dump it away out at sea or something like that. But there you go. That's a little something that we haven't talked about yet. I think the rest of this is pretty well in there, and uh, yeah, so we'll move on here. Oh, okay, so coastal and inland wetlands as well. This is more the freshwater, of course, that we're uh, uh, talking about inland and coastal. You're talking about uh, areas, well, well, wetlands are areas that are underwater for the entire year or a good portion of the year. And uh, there's a lot of biodiversity there. And like I said before, they cut down on the wind speeds. They mitigate the effects of a flood. And the flooding is getting worse because the sea levels are higher right now. And the water temperatures are higher, which gives more energy to those storms. And without those wetlands there to cut down on it, we're already starting to see more flooding than we've seen in the past. And that'll probably continue for a while. Cuts down on the erosion. Uh, but again, this is uh, areas that are highly desirable to live in. People like to live right near the, the water. And, um, and uh, you know, and also for agriculture in those areas, we've had to do it and uh, build cities. And so, yeah, so the estimate is in the U.S. we've lost about 50%, and in other places it's uh, even higher. And again, I don't think we knew what was going to happen when we were doing it, but we sure know a lot more now than we did before, and we'll see where we take it. All right, so these wetlands, worth uh, preserving, I guess. That's a matter of opinion, uh, but um, it seems to be a good thing environmentally, at least. Of course, there's always that balance of environmental and economic. Uh, so mitigation banking, the idea is if it's, there's a desirable wetland that you're going to develop, and it seems to be an economic incentive to do that for all involved, uh, then, um, you know, they say, well, you can do that, but now you have to create a new wetland area and you can restore these wetlands as well. Now, of course, as we've talked about before, it's a lot easier to prevent the damage than it is to restore it afterwards. So, you know, the argument against this is you're really making things a lot harder on you than you needed to in the first place. It's a lot more difficult to do the, uh, what you're talking about than to leave the wetland that uh, we're talking about. But again, there's always this, uh, this back and forth between the idea of economic and environmental. All right, so on the left, you have uh, the after picture. Well, actually, I guess it was the before picture, and then they damaged the wetlands, and the right is the after picture, if you will, but also the before of the good news of the cleanup. Um, so there is a success story again, and uh, you know, now we know a lot more than we knew before. I guess I've said that a few times. 
during this presentation. Okay, we've talked about a few people. Boylan Slatt, who as a high school student was uh, looking to change the world and is continuing in that direction right now. And uh, here's a guy as well, older person in this case. And I guess the idea, if I remember from reading the book here, right, Mr. Callender, he uh, had a health problem. And they said, you got to go out and walk a little bit with his heart or something like that. And they said, you got to go get some walking. So he was walking along these wetlands that he enjoyed um, walking along and noticed how degraded they were, and he got around there to uh, restoring it. So when you see those before and after pictures, there's going to be some stories and some people involved uh, with every one of them. So here's one that they talked about, Jim Callender, 1982. Okay, and uh, the Everglades. So I have a good friend who uh, went on in environmental studies, and she is a professor who did a did a bit of her work to become a PhD in the Everglades. So I've gotten some interesting insights into that. Um, but yeah, so uh, basically it's a huge wetland down there in uh, Florida. Now, South Florida is a major area for development. You know, that's a that's where it stays the warmest in the country, for you know, one of the warmest areas in the country, and people like to get away from that. And the development there has been incredible. Um, you know, Google Earth is a pretty good one for seeing satellite pictures. And they have satellite pictures now that you can see a time lapse of 30 years. And uh, South Florida is an interesting area to see in the last 30 years what the development has been. Um, okay, so the idea there is we've uh, they've used it, they've tried to develop over it, they've used it to um, divert the water to go to other places, uh, they've tried doing all these different things, and um, at the same time invasive uh, plant species and animals as well are getting in there. The Burmese python is a big one right now, and um, so then at some point they realized, uh, you know, we have to try to try to fix this uh, up a little bit. So this has been going on for a long time, and it's an amazing amazing amount of money involved and uh, with uh, very grand ideas of what they're going to do. Uh, straightening the river didn't seem to be the greatest thing so that they want to put it back. Again, millions and billions of dollars being put into trying to restore what you know back to where it was before you messed it up in the first place. But again, we really didn't know what was going on. So they're coming up with all this stuff and it really hasn't been uh, all that successful. And it's just, there's just so much to it right now. So they're getting frustration after frustration at that. And South Florida, as they're developing now, is also seeing the sea levels rise uh, as well. So there's projects now that pump the water off of the roads that are right along the ocean uh, because they're getting flooded uh, more and more often. So yeah, they got a lot of, they're up against it down there in the Everglades. So this is the biggest uh, restoration project that we're looking at. So maybe it'll be uh, deemed a success at some time. We're still not there yet. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, maybe the sea levels will rise and all of it will be underwater. Some scenarios say that that's inevitable at this point. But uh, we will see. We will see. We're living in interesting times, of course. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the Everglades and right down there in prime real estate. I'm guessing some of you know people who live down there and some of you have been down to that area. What a popular destination down there. Lots of people. Okay, so again, um, we are doing this as we've gone through the HIPCO with the marine, the saltwater. It's happening for freshwater as well. So we are cutting down on um, through HIPCO with the... Um, the freshwater and the marine, you know, the salt water. Uh, Great Lakes are a big uh, water area for us too, the largest body of freshwater if you put them all together. I spend a lot of time in Wisconsin along Lake Michigan in the summer times and uh, they have some of these problems up there. Very interesting to hear the local issues. Wherever you go, there's going to be a local issue, as we've said before. Um, so yes, they've been invaded by the uh, non-native species and the Asian carp is a really big one right now. Those are uh, tough to get rid of, and they're just making their way everywhere now. And the interesting thing about them is they're attracted to boat motors. So if you're driving down, uh, you know, you're in your boat and you're going down the, the lake, uh, they're going to jump out of the boat at you. Do yourself a favor. Check out some of those videos. Okay, so this is the idea of the zebra mussels that I mentioned before, and they cause some problems. They also do a little bit of filtering as well, so there are some good aspects to the zebra mussel, but by and large, they're a big nuisance and... Um, really, really hard to get rid of. Don't know if they ever will be able to do that. Okay, so uh, here's the idea of the uh, with the things that we've done to rivers as well, so we can talk about them, and uh, the dams, of course, and we've talked a little bit in class about the hydroelectric uh, power that we're getting from dams, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in detail and how it's done uh, when we talk about uh, different forms of energy. 
Um, but yes, of course, there are pros and cons. The getting the electricity is a good thing, uh, being able to control that. We like to have that. That has been something that has really dramatically changed the life in a lot of different areas. I got a chance to see that by the Tennessee River in uh, Tennessee this year and talk to some people about the idea of, uh, you know, how the Tennessee Valley Authority brought electricity to that whole area and uh, dramatically changed the way of life almost immediately by getting electricity, as you can imagine, but not too long ago, right? Um, but anyway, the other thing that they do is, as I said before, they flood out behind them, so the habitat is lost, and also the nutrients that are running down uh, stream or down river toward the estuaries are now not going to get there because uh, the flow has been interrupted. And also there's migratory patterns for uh, different species of fish, so that's cut into, and so that's the deal on that one, and uh, we have this going on in rivers. The other thing about damming up a river, we already have disagreements in uh, from state to state. You know, if you're down river and I dam the river up uh, up river from you, uh, I've, I've made a decision that's an interesting one for you. And in the Middle East, you've got to talk about how those decisions are affecting country to country because uh, uh, that water is a big issue there. Yeah. All right, so of course we get um, electricity, we can uh, flood, uh, control the floods a little bit, we get a water supply, and it's good for uh, growing crops and all, but uh, yeah, like I said, with the migratory pattern of fish, the salmon uh, have a real rough go at it. Okay, so here we go again. Uh, this is the stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, purify the water, I guess I could add that in. I think the rest of these we've already talked about. So these are the ecological services of the river, and these are the reasons that we should do it. And um, yes, so again, laws, uh, putting it as an economic uh, system and maybe trying to preserve them. The Wild and Scenic Rivers Acts is where, you know, once a river has been put under this classification, then you can't do any development there. You can use it for maybe hiking or things like that, but uh, you're not going to do any development. So that preserves a lot of areas and uh, also now looking to sustainably uh, fish uh, as well. Um, Edward O. Wilson. I uh, recommend reading Edward O. Wilson books. I've certainly enjoyed reading some Edward O. Wilson already, and uh, there's a bunch still out there for me to read, so I enjoy it. Recommend it as well, but uh, he's a really interesting character. Um, Edward O. Wilson is from the books that I've read, and um, started out just looking at ants, became a world specialist in ants, and then he became interested in the whole environmental thing. And Just a really interesting uh, read I would recommend that to anybody interested in the subject of environmentalism at all. Um, okay, so his uh, advice is that we map it out so we can use the technology to understand what our resources are rather than just using them. Uh, you know, a lot of times in the history of humans, you knew what you were doing locally. Other people knew what they were doing locally, but people didn't know what was going on all around. Old growth forests, you know, uh, preserve these hot spots that we talked about in other chapters and uh, restore what we got and and uh, conserve what we have and restore what we've Sitting in the morning sun I'll be sitting when the evening comes